Over the years, there's been a lot of face gear bikes that have come and gone, but not all of them are going to be winners and receive cult-like collectible status. Time will forget most of them, but not me. What's up, I'm Zach Gallardo. I've been riding fixed gear bikes exclusively for the past 12 years. And in my time, I've seen a lot of bikes come and go. The good, the bad, the ugly. How many of them do you remember? But one of them that's not discontinued is this video's sponsor, Wabi Cycles. EuroAsia Imports EAI is not from Europe or Asia, but rather the imported bikes and components from Europe and Asia, hence the name. I know, it's really confusing and makes perfect sense at the same time. They're from the US, if that wasn't clear. EAI doesn't make the Italian built out of Italian tubing bare knuckle anymore, or the Japanese built out of Japanese tubing from the legendary Japanese builder Toyo Godzilla anymore, but we all still remember these legendary bikes. There's an ugly, less fondly remembered duckling in the EAI catalog. That is the EAI Brass Knuckle. The Brass Knuckle is from the bad old days of aluminum track bikes that came with aluminum forks. Super harsh riding. It had a compact geometry with a sloping top tube, which back in the early 2000s when the Brass Knuckle debuted was greatly frowned upon for not being track specific enough and looking too much like a road bike. It had clearance for a weenie 23C tire, which in all fairness was the standard back then. It's just that today the brass knuckle will be hard pressed to find a loving rider with tires getting wider and wider. The welds were as chunky as cottage cheese and the only two colors it came in were primer gray and past dew honey mustard. EAI themselves even knew that this bike was born to fail. Not to say that the brass knuckle was a bad bike, it had a solid build quality and it was a stiff affordable aluminum frame set at a time when aluminum frame sets were much more expensive than they are today. But they knew that they made a bike that nobody wanted, especially when they had such good taste to produce bikes that have cult followings years after they stopped producing them. I remember when I was a broke high school student shopping for my dream bike, which was an EAI bare knuckle, and I would be scrolling through Craigslist and see posts for EAI BK, $250. I'd click on it immediately and then be disappointed when it's an EAI brass knuckle. Prospective customers couldn't find any info on the brass knuckle. What kind of aluminum? IDK, bro. How much did it weigh? Beats me. Was the fork aluminum? Probably, says people on the forums. And a red flag for bikes is that they don't have a geometry chart readily available. The brass knuckle did not have a geometry chart. It was so bad that this guy on Pedal Room contacted EAI directly about it, and then he reported back, they sent me a photo of what looked to be like writing on a napkin scanned in, but no real measurements. With the reply, yeah, they told me they no longer had a chart anymore. EAI just wanted to forget that the brass knuckle ever existed. Unlike the ugly duckling in the story, this one never grew up to be beautiful. The brass knuckle was taken around to the back of the barn and buried in an unmarked grave off in the woods as the bare knuckle and the Godzilla, the two beautiful swans of the family, flew off into the sunset. But if you want to learn more about the bike that I ride, this video is sponsored by Wabi Cycles. As a fixed year YouTuber, I get to ride pretty much any bike that I want, but I choose to ride Wabi because they're the most fun bikes that I have ever ridden. Simple as that. A lot of times when you guys meet me in person, you ask me, so like, real talk, no camera, no sponsors, what do you actually think about Wabi Cycles? And what I say on camera is the same thing that I'll tell you in person. It's the best bike that I've ever ridden. I love my Wabi Special and my Wabi Thunder. And the thing that makes them so fun to ride is that everything is for a purpose. Wabi is the Japanese tradition of finding beauty in simplicity. And to make the bikes simple yet extremely fun to ride, give you that zen feeling when you pedal your fixed gear, Wabi starts off with Reynolds 725 tubing or Columbus Spirit tubing, which is some of the lightest, most lively tubings that you can make a bike out of. Be sure to check out Wabi Cycles, linked in the description. The 1990s saw legendary track bikes that are now holy grail fixed gears for many riders today. Most notably, there's the Cannondale Track and the GT GTB. But there's an odd and often forgotten duck in this row the KHS Aero Track. You either love the KHS Aero Track and appreciate that it's dripping in vibes with its wacky, weird, wiggly seat tube, or you hate it for its al dente, spaghetti looking ass, wacky, weird, wiggly seat tube. That bendy boy isn't just for show though. 
The KHS AeroTrack debuted in the 90s when bike makers were just experimenting with aero profile frame sets. And the weird wiggle in the C-tube is there so that the rider can tuck the rear wheel into that wiggle and ideally get aerodynamic gains. Unfortunately, math is really hard and uh, even with the wheel jammed in the track end, the wheel didn't quite get to the wiggle. But what makes the KHS AeroTrack at least an eyebrow-raising feat of engineering is that it is made out of true-tempered steel. I'm no metallurgist, but I'm pretty sure steel doesn't like to bend like that. This thing is probably just about as aero as a non-aero frame set, but at least it has fixie points. And if you want to elevate your fixie points, I'm selling these chain gang bracelets. They're the world's first bracelet that are made out of NJS components. These are DID stainless steel racing pro NJS links. Although everybody already bought the NJS stamp versions, we still have some non NJS versions available for sale and they're a little bit cheaper. But the KHS AeroTrack loses some fixie points with the basic kind of uggo unicrown fork, but at least the fork has a nice curve to it to accentuate the seat tube. And all of the finishes from the classic orange to the silver to the metallic purple pop off, making this bike a cult classic. Whether you love it or hate it, you can't deny that the KHS AeroTrack is an instantly recognizable bike in the sea of diamond-shaped frame sets, which the KHS AeroTrack eventually became in 1998 and onward. If you've made it this far in the video, I feel like I've earned your thumbs up, so be sure to like the video and hit the subscribe button because according to my YouTube stats, about 70% of you watching this video right now are not subscribed to the channel. So subscribe to watch more fixed gear videos just like this one. The 98 AeroTrack took a brief trip into aluminum frame sets, pioneering aggressive pursuit track geometry, which actually made the bike more aerodynamic, provided that the rider's neck is flexible enough to ride the thing. In 99, the AeroTrack went back to steel tubing but kept the Pursuit geometry until the AeroTrack morphed into the KHS Flight 100 at the turn of the century. The 2000 and 2001 KHS Flight 100s were basically 99 AeroTracks with different decals. And then the Flight 100 eventually mutated into a literal Kilo TT with different decals. You either die a hero or live long enough to see yourself become a Kilo TT. Let me know in the comments, why do you think that the Cannondale track became this collectible cult icon, while the Cannondale capo was instantly forgotten once Cannondale stopped producing it in 2011. I think it's because of three things. The Cannondale track is a made in the USA Cannondale track bike. Number two, it looks cool. And number three, as it gained more notoriety and popularity, it just snowballed from there and more and more people wanted it. The Cannondale Capo is not as revered as its predecessor, but it packs a mighty wallop for flying so far under the radar. Just like the Cannondale track, the Cannondale Capo was also hand built in the USA back when that was Cannondale's whole thing. It's made out of their signature oversized aluminum tubing to give you a great stiffness to weight ratio and bang for your buck. And it came stock with a carbon fork to absorb road vibrations. In Cannondale's own catalog, they refer to the Capo as the CAD5 track, referring to its racing roots. The Cannondale Capo is basically a modernized Cannondale track, so why was it left in the back of the shed in the collective consciousness of fixed gear riders? Well, those three points for why the Cannondale track gain iconic status. The Cannondale Capo is missing number two and number three. It just doesn't look cool, and if it doesn't look cool, it's not gonna get popular as shallow as that is, but it's all about the fixie points. The capo doesn't have a quirky threaded steel fork like the Cannondale track. It doesn't come in fun, sparkly colors like the Cannondale track. It doesn't have the same ridiculously instantly recognizable oversized tubing like the Cannondale track. And it doesn't have that ever so slightly pursuit sloped top tube like the Cannondale track. And if you look at the photos of a stock capo with front and rear brakes, bottle bosses, and riser bars, this bike was made for the street that can also be ridden on the track, which is not quite track specific enough for the purists that made the Cannondale track so famous. The Cannondale track is the Cannondale track. The Cannondale capo 
is just a fixed gear from Cannondale, but it's still a criminally underrated track bike. And if you're looking to extend your nostalgia trip with fixed gear bikes that time forgot, be sure to check out this playlist. Or if you wanna watch me roast your guys' current bike setups, go check out Fixie Points here. Fixie Fan shoutouts to David K, Salvador Lombroso, Jillian Carana, Brandon Black, Brent David, Mario Perez, and Tad Anchi for helping to make these fixed gear videos possible through their support on Patreon.